hashtag rebirth. Mm, yeah, wow. Oh, what do I think of things that make me want to throw up when I'm in beautiful places? I don't know. But uh, this is one of the only places, uh, if, of course it's on serpentine soil, where you get McNabb cypress, which is that dead guy right there, which burned about three years ago, uh, sympatrically occurring with sergeant cypress, which uh, I do not see in the immediate area, but I just drove by some about half a mile back. So two species of cypress living together. What's the world coming to? All social conventions are being smashed. Okay, got a nice sea of notice coming back here. And uh, here's some nice uh, Areophyllum. Asteraceae, of course, got a lot of Areophyllum recruitment. See those little fuzzy bastards on the ground right there? And, uh, of course, you got Quercus dorata, the, the shrubby leather oak, bright blue. Now, you might be asking yourself, why are so many plants in serpentine environments blue? And I would have to tell you that it's because uh, of the nature of the, the landscape they grow in. Serpentine, remember, a lot of things have trouble growing on it, so you get a very exposed and open environment as opposed to, like, a forest where you have a good canopy. Here's one of the 9,000 species of Cryptantha, Varaginaceae. And you got a cool little Streptanthus over here too, which is, a, remember that that's the kale family. This is a fascinating genus. This little bastard may look boring, but it's, uh, it's able to tolerate some of the harshest soil chemistry that's out there. What's going on? What else? I just seen another Ariagonum, but I don't know where it went. Anyway, so these cypresses right here, remember, they got these cones that look like little soccer balls, right? And what happens when they burn is that the resin that holds those uh, soccer ball scales together, uh, cause, it melts, and then it causes the soccer balls to open, thus dumping about 80 seeds per cone onto the ground right there. And so all these little bastards right there are about three years old. They're all the same age, and they all germinated when the parent tree burned. Now, the thing about McNabb cypress, which is pretty amazing, you get up close, See all those little white dots? Those are resin glands. And this resin smells pretty fantastic. I'm not gonna lie, it smells kinda racy, you know? Like if you made a cologne out of this, I mean, cologne's generally a terrible idea to begin with, but if you did make a cologne out of this, or some sort of essential oil for the hippies or something, they would buy it en masse. It smells amazing. This and Hesperocyperus bakeri, baker cypress, both produce some of the best smelling terpenes of the cypresses in North America. Now another thing about the the McNabb cypress is it gets its foliage occurs in flat sprays. You see, you got the individual scales there. Each scale has a white dot. That's the resin gland, and then it occurs in flat sprays. It's kind of hard to see. Well, here it's it's and the older foliage is better. See, it's got like a flat a flat spray as opposed to a more juniper like foliage. Oh my God, I can smell the resin on my hands already. What a pleasant uh, what a pleasant smell. Oh look at this delicate fuck. Streptanthus hesperidus, another uh, narrow endemic jewel flower, member of the Brassicaceae. This one only known from serpentine in Napa and Lake County. Look at those flowers. Look at those. God damn it. Leaf margins get entire. See how they're just smooth? It's just straight. Whereas down here, it's dentate. The 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 distal uh, leaf leaves have margins that are entire, and the flowers are just fucking. So look at it. You. Dick. God, I love it. Oh! Another Cryptantha. Things are coming back pretty good after the fire, you know. Look at this massive Yerbasanta. Nice aerial dick, the end. Then this whole, this whole hillside up here is just full of germinating Arctostaphylos. Got some onions. Onions, onions, onions down there. Onions are already done. Look at it. Look, see, you got, got a seed in there. Now, onions are in the asparagales order, the asparagus order, like uh, agave and yucca. And one of the trademarks for not all, but some of the plants in that family, is they have black seeds like that that contain a substance called phytomelon. Phytomelon. Now, not all of them got to be. You look at agave or yucca seeds, they look very similar, except uh, they're flat, whereas the onion seeds, the allium seeds are round and black. But most importantly, some manzanitas germinating. Now, a lot of these will not germinate without fire. No idea on species. Actually, I do have idea on species. I think it's Arctostaphylos glauca. Got a see and note this right there, too. Buckthorn family. Look at this guy. Look at those imbricate leaves. Imbricated like roofing shingles. All sorts of stuff just germinating in response to the fire. 
Got the McNabe Cypress down there. A lot of nice stuff going on, you know. You got to get up close. And the soil, of course, once you dig through this, these little pebbles, it's like this, this puffy clay. And then it gets hard as a brick uh, once the, the dry season comes, which should be in a month or two. Pretty nice. Look at that, it's Pacara greeny, I had serpentine Pacara, another enigm enigmatic plant of serpentine, of the serpentine lifestyle, the ultramatic lifestyle. Uniseriate phyloris. So you got those roofing shingles in one series, just one series surrounding that involucre. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's fine. Maybe you gotta look it up, I don't know. Nice aster. The phyloreas are just these things, those green things. You know, you got a bunch of little seedlings going on right there. Got some iris, hasn't bloomed yet. And you got some particular larry. Pedicularis. Look at that. Parasitizing the oak, probably. Looks like it's already done flowering now. These are early. They're early flowers. Early flowering bastards. Oh, look, that iris is flowering already. You know, I don't get too jazzed off irises, I'll be honest with you. The iridaceae, they get real jazzed and experience their true beauty. You got to go to South Africa, where they got a lot of diversity. Look at the talus, the serpentine talus. Holy! Look at that, on a barren goddamn hillside, there's just tons of this Streptanthus morrisonii. Those beautiful yellow flowers. With those little things coming out of them, those antennas, they look like bug antennas reflexing out of them, curving back. Those are the anthers. Those are the male parts. This the strep taint this cack. Well, what, that's, those are two of the anthers. Then the other two are, uh, see, strep has anthers, two sets of anthers, four anthers total, two each, two, two to each set, and it's got them at different lengths. One's longer than the other. There's a word for that, but I forget what it is, and I don't care to find out right now. Just get right up in there. Look at it. Full frontal. Then you got another species of Streptanthus with the purple dentate leaves tapping out at about six inches with purple flowers. This is Streptanthus breweri. So you got all in all tree species occurring in a relatively uh, short area. Holy shit. Up this milkweed's up here. It, now here's an interesting one. Now here's a parasite uh, called Orobanchi. This is Orobanchi uniflora and it's parasitizing uh, this Facilia, which I believe is Facilia agena. Now, uh, uh, unlike some of the root parasites I was showing in a couple videos back, those parasitize fungi in the ground, this guy actually parasitizes other plants, as does everything in his family, the Orobanchaceae. Get up in there and look at those bilaterally symmetrical flowers. Got that nice calyx right there, consistent of the sepals, the purple part, and you got this tube flower, bilaterally symmetrical. How nice is that? Actually, this may not be uniflora, because it's not just one flower, it's got a couple. I have to look this one up. It could be Orobanchi californica. Who knows? Still no sign of that damn milkweed, though. looking so hard for it only seen it once before never flowering and then there it was like a beacon in the night the elusive Asclepius solanoana the serpentine milkweed holy shit look at it look at those flowers nice you can see the pollinia now it's now milkweeds are like orchids in that they don't have powdery pollen their pollen is coagulated into little packets called pollinia all milkweeds do that. Orchids are the only plant family that does that. Now the, now the milkweeds used to be in their own, uh, their own family called Asclepioidae or something, Asclepiodaceae or something, I forget what, anyway. But now they got merged into the Apocinaceae, and they're just a subfamily in there. And this guy only grows on serpentine soil, fully exposed on south-facing ridges, north of the San Francisco Bay Area, up on into Trinity County. And none of the populations are ever very large. It's a very weird plant like that. You never see a lot of them. You only see a couple. And I'm just so damn happy to finally see it. I finally got you, you beautiful bastard. God damn, milkweeds are weird, huh? 
Look at that. Next time you're around a milkweed, get up in there and just look at it. They look alien. Okay, so you got those five sepals that open. I guess those are the petals, maybe. It's kind of hard to tell what's going on. Well, first off, you got a compound inflorescence. All right, corimba form. Then you get those sepals right there, the little breaks on the bottom, okay? And then these are the petals, those pink things that open up. You got five petals. You got the stigma right there, that green thing that receives the pollen. And then you, you get these like little recurved hoods, those white things. And under there is where the pollinia is. And it's just pretty odd, you know? I don't really know what to say about that. Weird goddamn subfamily of the apostinaceae. Look, here's a dainty little one. A full anthesis. Just a big cluster of beautiful flowers. They smell pretty good, too. Couple more up there. What a wonderful plant. What a weird distribution. Who knows when it emerged as a species. It's pretty widespread as far as uh, in serpentine habitat. I mean, it's... It's not that widespread. It only occurs in the western half of Northern California on the, on the west side of the Great Valley on Serpentine. Like I said, from Trinity County down into, I think, Sonoma is the furthest south. But, uh, you know, you got, you got a range that extends about, I don't know, what? What is it, 150 miles? 200 miles all on Serpentine? I'd love to see the seed when it's, uh, when it's mature. Uh, so you, you could see why people often refer to the chaparral uh, landscape as kind of a corn maze. Then that is just burned, and this is hard enough to walk through, you know. But imagine if all these manzanitas were still alive, covered in leaves and making a thick canopy that's just a little bit taller than the human head, making it impossible to see out. I mean, it's real easy to get disoriented in this kind of uh, environment. I'm trying to get down there to get get over to the other ridge to see if they got any more of that damn milkweed over there, you know. But uh, it's kind of rough going so far, you know. So again, all this burned about three years ago. It's fine. The landscape is adapted to fire. You can see tons of seedlings of this plant, manzanita, coming up right there. This is Arctostaphylos visita. It's got very sticky fruits. So you get your Leathero Quercus dorata. Now the land, th these landscapes, of course, have been burning uh, for millions of years. Pretty much as long as California has had a Mediterranean climate. That is, uh, wet winters and dry summers. Look at all the goddamn cryptantha right there. That's nice. Then you got your streptanthus, probably brewery. It's all the ash from moving, uh, moving the branches out the way. So the arrival of the Mediterranean climate, which of course was caused by global... Uh, changes in ocean currents. Actually, I think it might have just been the Isthmus of Panama arising and cutting off warm waters from the Atlantic from flowing into the Pacific, which they used to do anywhere from 6 to 10 million years ago. But anyway, when that happened, that's when you got the arrival of the, the wet winter and dry summer regime here in California. And that is when you got the arrival of a uh, a lot of these pyrophytic plants, not the arrival, the evolution of a lot of these pyrophytic plants, that is, plants that are adapted to fire, like these beautiful sergeant cypress right here. Oh, now here's a very nice and very fragrant thing to come up on, a massive bloom of rhododendron occidental, the western azalea, which uh, of course, uh, like many plants in California, is a uh, very tolerant of the ultramafic soils, the ultramafic lifestyle. Now look at it. You got those really long stamens, the little bug antennas, God, it smells good. You got the stamens right there, see that? You got six stamens, how many stamens is that? Only five, there should be, maybe there's six. No, maybe there's only five. 
five stamens this thing won't focus five stamens right there and then this is the female part the stigma which receives the pollen Ericaceae blueberry family Now this kind of a sketchy, barren, very steep environment is just the perfect habitat for the plant that I was just showing you, this Asclepius solanoana, which you see there's about six, seven, eight, nine, ten plants right here, plus a lot more down there. It really likes that full exposure. It's got the <clears throat> little tiny hairs on its leaves. You know, the leaf looks uh, shiny and smooth, but when you get up close, you realize it's actually somewhat tomentose and it's got a mild pubescence on it. There you go, full anthesis right there. Now you can see why so many people fall in love with the, uh, the ultramafic lifestyle. As barren and depauperate as it may seem at times, it does uh, cause the emergence of new species and plants. And all over the world it does this. You got serpentine in Cuba, you got serpentine in New Caledonia, you even got some very old serpentine in Pennsylvania from when there was a subduction zone there, I don't know, 400 million years ago. It's quite old. So here's a serpentine's version of a milkweed, Asclepius solanoana. And this is, uh, it's doing very well here. I mean, I'm counting at least 20, 30 plants. Boom. Hey, now, I can't get over it because I've been itching to see this plant for years this little bastard right there because I never seen it in bloom and there's got to be hundreds of plants here there's at least two or three hundred and they're the only thing growing here in this barren environment you got when I mean, you got a Arctostaphylos visita that means the need out there it's probably 60 years old kind of looks like hell because the soil is so toxic and then you got you got a streptanthus if you could see it growing right there but that's it it's just a totally barren environment, and this little milkweed is thriving. You got a milkweed and then the strip right there. It's amazing. It's doing so well in such depauperate, toxic soil. There's got to be two or three hundred plants there, easy. I'm seeing them down there. There's a bunch down there in that gully. Just loving this harsh exposure, this harsh terrain, this harsh chemistry, soil chemistry. God, I love serpentine. Anyway, so as I was saying about talus and where it comes from, it's only because the chemical structure of this uh, ultramafic rock is so unstable and crumbles in such a way that uh, readily crumbles in such a way that you get the, these basically these little pebbles that are created uh, from it being weathered. And then, of course, it... The, it bottom of the slopes you get the talus piles which uh, a lot of plants uh, a lot of endemic plants have evolved to strictly grow in like that Clarkia breweri like that Fritillaria falcata uh, and so on even some of the streps seem to love uh, the talus it seems like there's almost no soil there except deep down and uh, it's just mostly composed of just masses of these uh, serpentine pebbles